to this last seminar, departmental seminar of the term. I am Kitty Stewart, for anyone out there who doesn't know me. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Vicente Silva to do this, to present this last seminar of the term. Vicente took his PhD in the Department of Social Policy at the University of Edinburgh. And he is now an LSE fellow in the department. And he's got a fantastic title to his talk, The Schumpeterian cons Consensus, The New Logic of Global Social Policy to Face the Fourth Industrial Revolution. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from you, Vicente. Over to you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Um, we'll see if it works. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so uh, just to introduce my paper, um, I have to say that this is a part of a broader research project that I um, I started in my PhD and has to do with the with the impact of digitalization and the fourth industrial revolution uh, agendas in global social governance, especially global institutions. So uh, these are other topics that I focused on that unfortunately I won't have time to describe, but uh, are part of, of my project. The first is how these uh, processes uh, emerge as a new global problem in the last decade. Uh, other two um, aspects have been more focused on particular organizations, the ILO um, and the development of a human-centered approach to technological change. The OECD and the World Bank um, also have proposed a different way of looking at these, these processes from an inclusive growth uh, framework or approach. But this paper in particular um, is focused on how global institutional change has been promoted by this agenda in the 2010s. So this is more or less an extension, uh, but also being built on the previous uh, topics. So I'll try, I'll try to summarize most of them, although if there are gaps or things that are not appropriately explained, uh, I think it has to do with other papers that I'm preparing or that are already published. Um, Maria, maybe you can click there. Okay. Uh, so this is the plan of the presentation. First, I'm going to um, talk about my approach to global institutional change in the, con in the context of this uh, fourth industrial revolution or the digital transformation. Then I'm going to uh, explain more or less the, how in the literature these institutions have been understood, especially in relation to the, the divide between economic and social organizations in global governance. Then I'm going to uh, analyze the different agendas and initiatives developed by these institutions uh, in relation to digitalization. Uh, to then describe what I call the Schumpeterian consensus or the mentors of a new transnational policy paradigm and a new model of the welfare state uh, as a consequence of this uh, deeper and broader process. Uh, and lastly, I'll be uh, just reflecting on some policy expressions of the Schumpeterian consensus, how it's been translated into specific policy recommendations and instruments given by these institutions in the last, in the last year. Um, looks like this. So, um, as you probably know, in the literature in the last five to 10 years, uh, this process of the digestion has been pointed as, or has been represented as a new source of social risk. Uh, that's common in the social policy literature to, I mean, the link between industrial transformations and social risk this is not something new. Uh, I'll give just a few definitions so we can share the same vocabulary, let's say. So, a uh, the OECD defines digitalization as the use of digital technologies and data, um, which results in, in uh, new or changes to existing activities. Uh, and the digital transformation is 
maybe the, the economic and societal effects of this process or the expansion of, the, of digital technologies. Uh, in, second, in second place, we have that the, this, is, this is another notion that has become uh, part of uh, common sense, mostly in, in the last five years, especially. The fourth industrial revolution uh, has been understood as the fusion uh, of physical and digital domains in the sphere of production, which has been translated, especially in the last 10 years, uh, into a series of processes, for example, the automation of production, um, the use of artificial intelligence, uh, of data for decision making, and so on. Um, and although I can't say much about this, these processes because they've been well described in many books and papers, um, what I can say is that at least in the in social policy, it's been clear that all of these processes pose new challenges, new risks. Uh, related to technological unemployment, derived from the automation of production, of course, uh, the spread of surveillance techniques at work or from the state, the urbanization of, of work, uh, especially in relation to the gig economy, the skills mismatches um, derived from technological change, algorithmic bias, and so on and so forth. Uh, so there, there's been a lots of responses from states and international actors in relation to this agenda or to these risks. Uh, there's been a sense of urgency and uncertainty in relation to what can actually happen and what institutions should do. Uh, governments and companies have been urged to prepare, to adapt, uh, to be competitive in this new digital world. Uh, so, for example, we have the World Economic Forum as a big uh, player in this in these debates. Uh, Klaus Schwab, its uh, founder, says, "In the new world, it's not the big fish which eats the small fish; it's the fast fish which eats the slow fish, giving the sense of urgency." And at the same time, we have a uh, Nobel Prize in Economics Robert Schiller saying, "We cannot wait until there are massive dislocations in our society to prepare." for the fourth industrial revolution. There's this sense in, in all institutions in different levels that uh, preparing for this process is mandatory. Uh, regional organizations, for example, the EU has proposed many frameworks to regulate platform work, artificial intelligence, uh, and so on. And at the same time, social partners uh, on a national and international level have also interpreted how this process could benefit or harm them. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Um, so when it comes to the academic debate, we can say that scholars have, uh, in many cases, prescribed institutional change instead of studying. So we can see, for example, in these quotes from I first and colleagues, the digitalization of platformization required profound rethinking of 21st century welfare provision. Nubler as well says, managing the process of technological, social, and economic transformation requires a comprehensive strategy which involves the forging of a new social consensus on the report. Uh, my question though is not uh, prescriptive. I, I'm not really interested in this paper about, um, I'm not interested in, Given recommendations at all, but what I want, what I wanted to do was to study empirically how institutions have been changing, uh, especially global institutions. So my main question is, how have global institutions responded to this agenda? Uh, at the same time, and in relation to these quotes, to the the tone of the academic discourse, uh, I've been interested about the, whether these institutions have rethought welfare provision in the last decade. And at the same time, if there's, uh, if there's a new consensus, if what Nubler was mentioning has already happened in global institutions. Thank you. So the framework I've chosen to address these questions um, comes from the sociology of global institutional change, specifically from a paper by Sarah Bab and Kentile 
Kent B. Kelenis, uh, from this year, from the Annual Review of Sociology, uh, which is focused on the Washington Consensus. That's what these authors uh, normally write about, but I wanted to apply their framework to uh, another process uh, in the social policy field. So what they say is that we should look at three dimensions that operate not necessarily as explanatory factors, but as conditions or conditions of possibility or uh, the emergence of a new consensus. So they say we should look at the balance of forces in the international political economy that relates to uh, international relations, to the balance between international and multinational companies and states and so on and so forth. A second dimension would be uh, looking at agendas and internal processes in international organizations that can mobilize this uh, new consensus. And in third place, we see that the, there's an ideational dimension that is really important, the predominance of certain ideas and paradigms uh, in international debates. So um, what does change provoke? according to sociological institutionalism. It, it leads to two uh, phenomena, let's say. So the first is the emergence of a, trans, a new transnational policy program, shared ideas about uh, policy uh, frameworks or um, that are shared by a large variety of international actors or new models of actors, uh, institutional templates. For example, a model of the state, or a model of university and so on. Uh, and the, the best example of this is the Washington Consensus. We know that it was, uh, it emerged in a certain moment uh, of the international political economy when America was the only hegemon internationally. It was pushed forward by uh, international organizations, uh, Bretton Woods institutions related to the structural adjustment agendas and programs, et cetera. And of course, there was the predominance of neoliberalism or market fundamentalism uh, behind that as well. So I'll use that framework to make sense of this consensus that I'm describing um, using, as I said, sociological institutionalism and uh, document analysis. So I base my analysis on uh, flagship reports, documents uh, produced by global institutions, especially by secretaries. Uh, these are very complex institutions. I know that there's a, uh, they operate regionally, country offices and so on. So I've just focused on the like central secretary, if that makes sense. So the arguments in relation to those three dimensions that the arguments that I hold is that, and I, I will unpack each of them. The first is that the, this divide between economic and social institutions that I was mentioning at first has been eroded uh, in the context of this agenda, making possible convergence in terms of ideas between a variety of global institutions. The second is that the digitalization has been a top priority in the agenda of, uh, of UN agencies, the OECD, the World Bank. Uh, and even though they've had different approaches, they are not antagonistic as they used to be in previous global agendas. And the third argument is that despite those differences, uh, there's consensus about the future role of the welfare state in this process of transformation, in the sense that there's a common policy paradigm and a common model of the state. So I'll first refer to the IP, to the international political economy aspect. Um, so global social governance as a field has been commonly described as a war of positions between two discourse factions. We have on the one hand, economic institutions that are mostly concerned about growth, liberalizing market economies, uh, ensuring the competitiveness of national economies as well. So there we have most commonly the World Bank, the IMF, the OECD, the WTO. On the other hand, we have social institutions that 
uh, are more concerned about human rights, about institutional regulations, and, and the social dimensions of the economy in general. Uh, and the most prominent is probably the ILO, the, and the UNDP, and also UNESCO and UNIDI. So in the literature, uh, the literature has described a logic of antagonism between these two sides. Uh, and that makes sense because it's been quite evident in past global agendas that there's, there's been a clear divide between them, ideologically, politically, uh, in terms of ideas. So in agendas about globalization, there, there was a huge contrast between uh, Bretton Woods institutions, for example, and the ILO. I was focused on the social dimensions of globalization. In the global financial crisis as well, they would prescribe uh, policy um, solutions or pathways that were very different um, in relation to fiscal policy and so on to manage the crisis. So uh, this divide has been true, has existed in practice. Yeah. The thing is, in the last decade, um, there are two factors that have undermined this divide, in my view, which have been a condition or have made possible the, the convergence of otherwise uh, contrasting or um, yeah, actors in, in global governance. So the first factor is the expansion of the inclusive growth paradigm in the international community. Uh, since the 2000s, there's, the, there's an increasing idea in global governance, especially in liberal institutions such as the OECD or the World Bank, even the IMF, that economic growth is, uh, can be undermined by inequality. So inclusiveness uh, is a really important, it's a function of policy goal. It's part of the package. So, um, these institutions, especially the OECD and the World Bank, have, had, uh, have put forward inclusive growth initiatives that have remained their conception of the economy in general. Um, so inclusiveness is not a monopoly of social institutions, let's say, anymore. In second place, we have that far right populism, especially in the last five years, um, put uh, pose a, a big threat for the liberal international order and for multilateralism in, in general. So the, the consequences of this process, of this factor, uh, were different in each organization. So the OECD, for example, the director general of the OECD uh, took this, this trend as a kind of excuse or a, it was a, it, it made the OECD focus much more on redistribution, social dialogue, inclusiveness in general. Uh, while on the other hand, the ILO has had the opposite trajectory. So it has adopted a much more pro-business discourse because far right governments at the ILO were especially influential uh, in tandem with business. So they could effectively reorient the institutional discourse of the ILO in the last years. And I described that in a paper on the ILO published this year. Uh, the main point of this is that polar institutions or institutions that were supposed to be different in terms of uh, ideas and, and politics uh, have been getting closer. And something that proves or that uh, makes this evident has been the global deal for decent work and inclusive growth uh, signed by the OECD and the ILO, in which they have merged their social policy agendas, especially related to labor market policy, social protection. So that indicates more or less that the divide is not as clear anymore. Yeah. So I'm now gonna focus on the organizational dimension, how different agendas and initiatives um, emerge in relation to digitalization. We see first that UN agencies um, implemented several initiatives and in different agencies, um, plans or uh, frameworks oriented towards 
humanizing technological change. So the most famous was the ILO's um, future, of work, future of Work Initiative that took place between 2015 and 2019, uh, was uh, finalized with the ILO Centenary Declaration for the Future of Work. It was the main topic of the institution's centenary. And what that initiative put forward was, uh, or what created was the human-centered approach to technological change, which basically emphasizes the importance of uh, promoting the institutions of work in a changing world of work. Uh, and also the importance of adapting institutions to, um, for example, education institutions to labor market needs to technology that change. On the other hand, the UNESCO published um, three weeks ago, I think, uh, the recommendation on the ethics of AI, which is the first international instrument uh, on artificial intelligence. And the UNESCO has encouraged member states basically to establish institutions that preserve human rights and that guarantee human oversight. Uh, on AI systems. So uh, humanizing in this, in this sense has had to do with human rights, but also with stressing the need of a human component in decision-making in organizational settings, broadly speaking. Now, the OECD um, has also put this, this topic uh, at the core of, of their agenda especially in relation to the Going Digital Initiative, which hasn't finished, but it's, uh, it's an initiative that gives uh, technical support to countries, to member states, so they can assess their own situation in terms of um, technological development. And, and in terms of social policy, uh, it's interesting to see that the OECD remade their frameworks in different areas. Uh, in the context of technological change. So the first one is the job, the need of strategy. Uh, we know that in previous job strategies, the OECD had supported a very liberal approach. Uh, but in this case, the, they took inclusiveness and quality of jobs more seriously as part of the framework to assess countries, um, especially considering recent trends in the labor market especially in the developed world that had to do with the rise of platform work, the increase of non-standard jobs and so on. On the other hand, they remade their skill strategy, uh, emphasizing the importance of digital skills and um, of changing the skills profiles according to technological change. So that would involve, of course, lifelong learning programs. Uh, which are at the, at the center of the newer, of the new OECD understanding of education. Uh, at the same time, the OECD has produced uh, AI principles, which are a list of values um, that are supposed to be considered by member states to, to regulate AI in general. And the basic principles are the rule of law, democratic values, and human rights. So there's agreement in OECD countries that those principles should be at the basis of any uh, regulatory effort. Uh, and it has critically influenced the G20's approach to, this, to the digitalization of <laughs> AI in, in general. Um, yes. So the World Bank has also um, join these debates, um, especially in their world development reports, which are the arguably the most influential, most read uh, publication in the development field. So in, on the one hand, they focused on the benefits of the digital technologies. Uh, so the, the, the report from 2016, digital dividends, or the one from this year, data for the better lives. Uh, that's more or less the, the approach, no? Of how they can increase productivity, efficiency in organizations, how they offer opportunities in general. But at the same time, they've been um, 
they focused a lot on risks on how these new technologies can, uh, especially automation, can create new problems, uh, polarization of jobs, of jobs markets in general, uh, how platforms, again, are not only uh, oppor not only offer opportunities, but also many problems in the labor market. So they had this kind of balanced approach. Uh, the main initiative they developed is the Human Capital Project that, again, offers technical support to countries. So they are, countries are assessed in terms of the development of human capital, uh, the ideas that countries can invest in education and health. So the workforce is prepared for technological change. That's more or less the rationale. Uh, and also, their, they remade their social policy framework. Uh, so the Protecting All book um, defends universalism, flexicurity as a paradigm in social policy, and a pentapartite social dialogue model that would include non-standard workers and the self-employed. So these ideas seem quite radical considering the World Bank's uh, history. Uh, they've been normally a defender of, of liberalism or neoliberalism in, in the international arena. But in the last few years, they, they've experienced some important changes in terms of policy ideas and orientations. Um, now, so I'm, I'm not really able to explain their different approaches or why each institution has uh, done what they've done in, in that particular way. Uh, because the focus of this, this paper is, um, of course, on commonalities. So it's not about any specific actors. But what I can say is that there has been several trajectories that have shown that this has been a, a priority in this institution's work. Uh, they developed different conceptual approaches, human-centered, inclusive growth. Uh, many reports have been focused on this. There are different analytical focuses on uh, normative horizons. Uh, but the, the main the strategy all these institutions support is basically to invest in people uh, in different ways, of course. So UN agencies are mostly interested in, uh, are, they urge countries to invest in, in, in social dialogue, in workers' capabilities, the OECD in employment and social protection, a more social democratic way, and the World Bank um, in human capital and lifelong learning. But the idea is that the state has an active role in this process. Uh, and the, of course, the, the overall aim is that countries can balance economic opportunities and social and human risks uh, related to this, this transformation. Um, so I'm now going to concentrate on the ideas dimension. That is the, I would say, the core of the paper. Uh, maybe not, but then it. So in many reports, it's possible to find that uh, there's a common narrative on the digital transformation um, beyond policy recommendations, beyond instruments. Um, we can see here in this list of uh, quotes that institutions from different, sorry, uh, reports from different institutions were talking about the same kind of process or understanding of technological change. So someone from the ILO says, um, technological change is understood as a process of creative destruction. The OECD, a process of creative destruction is underway. The World Bank, uh, technological process is intensifying creative destruction. Schumpeter's creative destruction is unfolding on a global scale, says WTO. The IMF says uh, these new, these innovations come with or can bring high productivity, but they are uh, related to also some risks. Um, yeah. So uh, I don't th this could be a detail. Um, but I think it, it tells or it um, helps us to understand the, the kind of um, intellectual basis of this, all these initiatives and approaches that I've mentioned. And I think that 
global institutions uh, in, the, in the last decade shared uh, this, the same conception about development as creative destruction. So this comes from Joseph Schumpeter, who is a, who was a Austrian economist, famous for his idea of, cre of creative destruction, which is the idea basically that economic development or economic progress uh, is only possible uh, when institutions are destructed or are destroyed or are disrupted by ways of innovation. So different industrial revolutions have caused massive changes in how society works, how communities work, how states work. So that's more or less the idea. Um, the thing is, should better understand this as a kind of organic process. So this government shouldn't really intervene. Uh, this, is, this is part of the, the, capital, the capitalist beast. That's how it works. But new Schumpeterian authors have said instead that institutions should mediate between these two trends. So uh, institutions are necessary. It's not that they are all, only going to be disrupted, but new institutions should uh, exploit the creative potential of technology while mitigating new risks. So that's the logic, uh, in my view, of global social policy. That has been the logic in the last decade, in the sense that um, there's a shared understanding that the state should operate as a mediator between cre the creative and the destructive potential of technology. Um, so the creative side, as I said at first, um, it's related to new jobs and occupations, tools, platforms, and techniques. And the destructive side to all the risks I've already mentioned, unemployment, polarization, um, surveillance, and privacy concern. So the state should prepare the workforce for technological change by adapting institutions, labor markets, individuals to this new era while mitigating and generating new regulations that can um, prevent those risks related to innovation. Or as uh, uh, Philip, Adrian and colleagues say, we need an investor state or an innovation state and an insurance state that, that is in their latest book, The Power of Creative Destruction, uh, published this year. So uh, in terms of the, the social policy implications of this, it's clear in the reports um, that global institutions now share or support the same social investment paradigm in the in the sense that this paradigm combines both dimensions, right? It understands social protection, social benefits as an investment, uh, especially um, related, for example, in this case to uh, preparing for the, for the digital transformation. And, and the main point in this paradigm would be to adapt institutions for technological change while mitigating risk, as I said, um, and it's important to note that this paradigm has been uh, quite influential in uh, global social policy or in these international organizations, but from a different logic from, uh, related to a workforce perspective, which I'll explain now. So uh, Bob Jessop uh, describes the workforce state uh, also as a Schumpeterian state in the sense that uh, it is supposed to manage uh, the, globaliz the process of globalization by adapting uh, society to it while uh, compensating users from globalization. So this was more, more or less the, the paradigm that was um, dominant uh, until the last decade in which competitiveness is a main goal, but also compensation. Uh, the underlying processes are post-industrialism and economic globalization. Uh, activation is really important in the sense of bringing back people to the labor market. But in that case, uh, it has a disciplinary component 
that is completely absent in this other form of state that I'm describing. Um, and in terms of uh, the global south, for example, the main the main focus of this paradigm was on on children, uh, childcare, for example, and also on conditional cash transfers, on <laughs> uh, making people change their behavior via social policy. And the, the main basis of this was inclusive, inclusive liberalism uh, or the post-Washington consensus, let's say. Um, whereas the Schumpeterian investment state, as I'm describing it, uh, its main goal is to prepare societies for the future of work or the, or the idealization while mitigating uh, the unequal effects of these new technologies. The underlying processes are different are now the fourth industrial revolution, for example. Um, inclusiveness has to do with universal social protection mostly. And I'm now gonna describe the, this social policy orientation so that is uh, clear. So um, we see that these different organizations have defined um, similar problems and they have similar orientations as, as I'll describe now. Um, the thing is, if, if, you, if you read these reports, the many reports they, they produce, uh, you'll see that technological change um, was considered to be expo exposing uh, problems in the traditional social model. So in employment relations, in conventional social policy, approaches and skills formation systems. Um, and policy expressions of this consensus are related to those three areas. So the first one has to do with employment relations. Um, we know that in previous global agenda, especially in the one on economic globalization, the formalization of jobs was the primary goal. Uh, you have lots of informality in the global south, uh, to a certain degree, non-standard jobs in develop, the developed world. So the main goal is to formalize. Um, but curiously, in the 2010s, um, different agencies were seem to be announcing the death of that of the standardization or, or the standard model of employment, uh, both as an empirical reality because of the persistence of informality and the massive increase in non-standard jobs in the developed world, but also as a normative horizon. So formalization uh, didn't seem to be um, the primary concern anymore. Dialogue, for example, said institutions created for an industrial age uh, need to be adapted for the 21st century. The World Bank said that technology is changing how people work and the terms under which they work. Uh, it's, revolutionizing or disrupting labor markets. And this it says in the future, many individuals will, will be working in flexible work arrangements. There was, the, there was the notion that the future is gonna be flexible and institutions shouldn't be focusing necessarily on uh, formalizing, but on uh, embracing flexibility as a reality instead. And in that sense, um, there was consensus on, on, on how to uh, approach or how to understand flex flexibility as part of a, a coin with two sides, no? so flexibility and security, that, that is flex security. So this is one of the most famous approaches in social policy, flex security, uh, that comes from Nordic countries. But um, this, hasn't, this hadn't happened before that global institutions would support uh, homogeneously the same model in um, social policy. So, the, for example, the World Bank says uh, the, the policy principle should not be to protect jobs that are becoming outdated and, and unproductive due to technological change, but to protect people, as the Danish flex security approach to labor market exemplified. Um, so the World Bank has quite explicitly supported uh, flex security for the global south, uh, which doesn't mean, uh, according to an interview, uh, doesn't mean that the whole bank wants 
all global south countries to become Nordic or that's not even possible. It's just uh, they're based on these principles that flexibility and security should be balanced. Um, and at the same time, the OECD says the challenge is to ensure that resources can be reallocated to more productive uses while providing a level of employment stability that fosters learning and innovation in the world. Uh, so innovation is supposed to be um, implemented only in conditions of flexibility or uh, adaptability in the private sector. Uh, uh, also, there's a very explicit um, support of, universal, of universalism in social protection. And the logic behind this is that uh, as a World Bank report says, uh, since all workers could be ex potentially exposed to, to displacement or to disruption, uh, governments should start thinking about universal strategies that protect people. Uh, that's more or less the idea. Uh, so it's, it's not about um, focalizing or focusing resources on specific groups, but to open social policy systems to everyone. And how? How? So uh, in different reports, you can find the same idea that social, social protection and social benefits should be decoupled from employment status. So uh, the only way flex security can work or flexible labor markets can offer protection is that the state uh, offers um, social policies that are not necessarily dependent on employment. Uh, and the instruments, these are policy orientations, very general, but the instruments these institutions support uh, are different. So I'm not saying they are completely the same. They, they differ in terms of uh, instruments. For example, the World Bank has been very vocal in terms of supporting a universal basic income, while the ILO has opposed to this kind of policy because it could have regressive implications. Um, yeah, so I'm not saying they agree on everything. It's just about the, the approach, the general approach and the models they, they seem to support. And this is the last one uh, before the conclusions. There's been not only international institutions, but global think tanks, even national strategies, you see a very strong emphasis on uh, skills, skills formation system. Um, that has to do with, the, um, with endogenous growth theory that became predominant in development economics uh, after the 80s, the 90s, that everyone understands that investing in human capital in education can let people internalize and adopt uh, innovations more easily. Also organizations, of course. Um, so the main, the main point here is that the World Bank says investments in human capital uh, have become more and more important uh, as a response to technological change. They developed the, as I said, the human capital initiative, etc. Even the ILO, that doesn't really, of course, yeah, skill, skills policies are important in the ILO discourse. Um, it wasn't as important as it is now in terms of resource allocation within the, the institution and interofficial discourse. So they say the ILO must direct its, its efforts to ensuring that education and training systems are responsive to labor market needs. Um, and we see that global think tanks, liberal institutions normally uh, have also stressed this idea of in investing in skills. Uh, the MGI, McKinsey Global Institute says governments should help workers develop skills best suited for the automation age, which are creativity, adaptability, things that a robot can do uh, normally. Uh, and the World Economic Forum as well has uh, launched an initiative called the Reskilling uh, Revolution, which is also, uh, can be found in many other, many other uh, authors and institutions, this, this, this discourse in particular. So conclusions, um, we've seen that global institutions somehow concentrated their agendas 
uh, in the last decade on the digitalization, the digital transformation, though to different initiatives um, and approaches. Um, the divide between economic and social institutions has uh, given way to a shared understanding of development of the role of the state, especially the welfare state in the economy. And um, I described the Schumpeterian consensus, which is this idea of creative destruction, the role of the state as a mediator, which has given the assumptions, or this have been the assumptions in the background of debates on institutional and technological change in the past decade. And this model of state that I describe as the Schumpeter investment state um, follows or supports a, a social model that is mostly focused on universal protection, tech security, and uh, skills development for the digital era. Uh, and before I finish, um, so I think it'd be really interesting to, to research, to study uh, in the current uh, COVID-19 agenda, this has been the case or the, the approach of these institutions and this consensus have uh, been still present. I have the idea that yes, but um, it'd be interesting to, to discuss that and, and study that more in detail. And also it's really important how these organizations have transferred or not these models to individual countries, how effective they've been into, in terms of uh, spreading these institutional models more broadly. Uh, I think that's it for now. And thank you. Terrific, thank you very much, Vicente, for a very, very rich and thought-provoking talk. Um, questions or comments? So, oh, then we have lots on the screen, or one on the screen at least. So, first of all, um, Laura, Laura Mann. Uh, I'm actually from the from the development segment, and this is my first social policy seminar. So thank you for having me, and I really enjoyed it. Um, and I'm really looking forward to reading this paper. This paper, I think it's such a interesting topic, and so I'm super excited. And I've seen your paper about the ILO, which I'll definitely read. Um, so my question is coming from from a development. Uh, department. department. So I was just in a social policy in Africa conference a couple of weeks ago, and I was a bit puzzled by this idea of, of, of there being kind of one framework around social, social policy, uh, because a lot of the, the kind of discussion in conference is, a, is around the way social policy has become very residual in African countries, that, that the kind of focus development has been almost, almost completely discarded. And it's just about just about social protect cash transfers, um, and certainly that's my experience. I've been recent been recent the research in Sudan and, and interviewing donors um, and members of the transitional government, government who around social protection protection, and only totally willing to fund cash transfer programs. They're not willing to fund health and education. The total budget for health and education from from the governments is I think 15% of what they're putting into this cash transfer program. So, you know, and this seems to be kind of trend and across the other countries that I'm aware of, particularly in, in Kenya, for example. So I, I kind of wonder, you know, I know, I've been reading the World Development Review, the, the 2021 at the moment for a review. review um, and, uh, you know, I, you know, I think it's very interesting. We looked at all these different documents, documents. see like the, the kind of the way that people talk about, dig about digitization into high income country countries, which is only 15 to 20 percent of the world's population, seems really discordant with discussions in developing countries or middle income countries where the, where the majority of the people live. Um, and so some of the kind of the way that these do that these talk about post-industrial societies and the challenges that brings to the welfare state, they don't seem re very relevant for countries that you know are trying trying to industrialize, don't have a lot of policy space to do kind of transformative social policy that would integrate social protection with 
think the things that you're talking about about other kinds of social elements so I just kind of I just kind of wanted to kind of that I, I found that kind of discordant um and what is what is your reflect on that uh, uh do you think that in the documents there's a kind of kind of myopia rest of the world that there's that there's kind of a too much of a eurocentric centric focus of think digitization within the context of high income countries and then kind of imposing it um, on other country, countries. If I can add on a final question, final question, if there are other people ask questions, then you don't have to answer this. But I wondered whether in any of these documents they talk about the gendered impact of digitization. If we think about the way, the way that global value ta chains um, have created a kind of feminization of labor in developing countries, uh, you know, in low skill manufacturing and how, and how digitization um, pretend undermine the kind of creation of huge amounts of women for women in the developing world. Is there any interesting discussions, discussions about the kind of gender acts of, of digitization? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. So you've got lots of questions there. Yeah, uh, thank you, Laura. So first of all, I um, it's very interesting what you, what you tell us about Africa. Um, how they it seems that countries are following a, a residual approach still. Um, I completely agree with you that um, this discourse or these uh, ideas that I've been talking about are discordant with debates in low or lower or middle income countries. Actually, if you look at there's a there's a really nice report made by the ILO published uh, four years ago called National Dialogues on the Future of Work. And they, uh, I mean, national ILO offices organized tripartite dialogues, um, that is governments, employers, and workers, uh, where they basically talked about the future of work, uh, but only some of them talk about technology, um, most noticeably uh, developed countries. So the thing is the ILO took the future of work as technological change, not necessarily as related to other to other macro trends. Uh, and the, you can see there that African countries, Latin American countries, uh, Middle Eastern countries, many of them were not mentioning at all the technology, or they they were much more concerned about informality, about problems that have been always that, that have always been around. So the thing is, institutions international institutions uh, sometimes feel the need to join trendy debates or to position themselves, uh, even if uh, that doesn't really reflect real problems uh, in a specific context. So that's quite puzzling in terms of the ILO. Uh, but yeah, I think there's, there's effectively some Eurocentrism. Uh, the ILO is a European institution, is located in Geneva, uh, social partners are based there as well. That doesn't mean that they don't do great, great work or they, they are not uh, contributing to social policy, social protection in different contexts. The thing is the institutional discourse doesn't seem to go in that way. Uh, and yeah, there's effectively some decoupling there. In terms of gender, uh, again, the ILO has um, a book on gender and the future of work published two years ago. The IMF has a report from three years ago about automation and gender. I, I would say that's, that's the main uh, dimension that uh, reports on gender have um, focused on. Automation, how um, female jobs can be affected by this kind of trends. But there are many other aspects, for example, related to algorithms, how can they affect uh, women in terms of recruitment, things like that, but uh, I haven't seen, I haven't come across that kind of, uh, those kind of discussions, at least in, in these agencies. I hope that. I just, yeah, I just wanted to clarify that African governments, I wouldn't say that, say that it's African governments following a residual approach. I think it's donors following a residual approach and making it very hard for African governments. It's, what they might want to do, which is which isn't such a residual approach. Um, um, so I just wanted to, but before those comments, I'll look at look at these ILO uh, reports on reports on gender. Interesting though that that you know talking you know talking of states, 
would imply talking a lot about women and, and care and sort of uh, social, re social reproduction. I would think that they would have, they would have a discussion of in specifically thinking about digitization and the welfare state. Um, but anyways, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Any other questions, comments? We sent in that case, I'll... Yes, I'll, I'll uh, oh, yeah. sorry, go, go, no, one, please. I've got plenty, but um, no, I feel as in my role as chair, I should cede to the, to the floor first. Okay, um, Vicente, I think I've got three questions for you here. The first is um, from a perspective of someone who, who's very ignorant about international political economy and, and the institutions that you've described here. Um, the first question is, what is the policy bite that is vested in the documents that you have described, that you've analyzed here today? Because it's as though the story that you've told us um, could be a story about changes in policy. It could be about changes in the relationship between state and citizen. It could be um, about historical change. But I wonder whether if these documents, as I imagine um, might be the case, don't have much policy right, then it doesn't cost any of these institutions to say what they say they, um, states should do. And if I'm right about that, then the alignment that you have described to us is significant chiefly in as much as the theoretical framework that you use, this inst uh, sociological institutionalism, provides us a window not into changes in states or changes in policy, but rather changes in the institutions that author the reports. Um, so that's the first question is, what is the policy bite contained within the documents that you've analyzed? The second is, um, I, I'm trying to wrap my mind around what counts or doesn't count as Schumpeterian policy approaches. Um, I have a hard time trying to imagine what would a policy approach look like that isn't Schumpeterian in as much as policy change necessarily implicates creative and destructive potential. Um, and that's, I, I'm happy to hold my hands up as just being ignorant about Schumpeter, mm -hmm. and I'm, 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 I'm inviting you to just set me straight on that. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems as though there's something, I, I mean, dare I call it non-falsifiable about describing policy change as Schumpeterian. Mm -hmm. The third question I have for you is a historical one, is that I'd like to know what's distinctive about digitalization that hasn't produced this consensus sooner, because I, I venture that um, were we to have this conversation 150 years ago, the invention of the tractor is doing not dissimilar things to the way people are imagining the relationship between state and citizen, between entitlements, between labor, between production and so forth. And so there's, underpinning your argument is that there's something about digitalization in particular, and I'd like to know what that something is. Thank you. Thanks, Johan. Thank you. Note that Vicente is taking notes on his computer. His and I'm very yeah, impressed. It's yeah. like a living embodiment as I sit here with my <laughs> pen, paper, <laughs> change. Um, yeah, so, uh, well, thanks, Johan. Uh, really interesting questions. Um, okay, so in first, uh, yeah, first in terms of the policy bite, um, there are two things. International institutions have different mechanisms of transfer, so different ways of influencing countries. So you have uh, countries that work on a naming and shaming basis, such as the OECD. The OECD basically recommends things, 
make reports, uh, but they don't really have any hard uh, mechanism of transfer. The World Bank, the IMF, uh, have to have uh, financial conditionalities that can actually force countries to adopt one uh, approach or, or another. The ILO uh, creates recommendations and conventions, so countries commit, but it's not that they will actually implement, uh, or let's say the ILO can only monitor, not force. So um, if, if this is going to have any impact on, on how states work, um, in terms of those mechanisms, we don't know yet. They do have uh, ways. So I can give an example. I can think of the UK. The UK has published many strategies in the industrial studies, the digital economy strategy, and this year the AI strategy. And all of them dialogue with reports from the OECD, for example, the AI principles are there because the precisely because the UK is part of the EA, it's part of the G20, part of the OECD. I'm a vocal member as well, like a leading member in terms of uh, international cooperation. So um, that's that's an explicit way in, in, in which uh, actual policy making has been influenced by these kind of institutions in an indirect way. It, this is all about soft governance, which doesn't mean that it's not relevant because at the end of the day, uh, these institutional templates or models can, can uh, become global, but for that, you need global actors that mobilize them. It doesn't, unless you have elements, you have countries that are so powerful that they can impose their own model, and that has happened, but we live in a multipolar world now, so it's pretty difficult that only one country will uh, get away with their own approach and will just spread it. So that's why these institutions are relevant. Um, so in, in second, in a, um, yeah, in second place, the what counts or not as Schumpeterian. Um, so the Schumpeterian aspect doesn't have to do with this focus on adaptation and mitigation because we know that in policy making that's a basic, those are basic dimensions, right? The thing is the centrality of technological change. So. In Schumpeter's understanding of, the, of development, technology is always a, a source of disruption. So you have to adapt and mitigate what technology does. That's the independent variable in a way. So that, that, in that sense, it's Schumpeterian because uh, in global social policy, technology had never been that relevant, uh, had never had that uh, causal, had never been understood as a causal force that is more relevant than other. And the, uh, and the centrality has, that it has in this kind of debate is something um, something new. On the other, so are there approaches that are not Schumpeterian? Yes. Um, international business, for example, or even in the UK, if you read what the Chamber of Commerce does, what the CDI does, in terms of in relation to digitalization, etc. There are views that are only optimistic about technological change. So they only focus on opportunities, on productivity, et cetera. Uh, but this, on, on the other hand, you have more radical organizations uh, on the left, uh, international unions and so on, that have only concentrated their, their frameworks and their discussions of risk. So this kind of balanced uh, view that uh, sees technology both as an opportunity as a risk is uh, that has been the, the, the kind of approach that these international institutions have had. But not all, not all countries have had that. For example, the UK has adopted this uh, risk oriented or has focused on human dimensions very, very recently, only this year or last year. But before that, it was all about being the global leader in, uh, in AI. How can we make the UK more competitive in a post-Brexit context and so on. So that is not a Schumpeterian approach. There's no destruction in that kind of understanding. But you can see also that, that understanding in, in some national cases or in international uh, organizations that I've mentioned related to business or labor, for example. The third question, what's distinctive about the digitalization that hasn't produced this consensus sooner? Um, so there were 
in the past decade, there were many predictions that were kind of apocalyptic about the, the implications of this technology. So the most famous paper, probably the most circulated in, in economics had to do with the risks of automation. So there was the idea that almost half of jobs could be automated in 10 years. And people were proving that with models. So people actually thought it was the thing. Um, the ILO, that's why they, they for example, took this, this topic as at the core of their centenary, the World Bank produced at least three or four books on the topic uh, because there were predictions based on model, modeling that seemed pretty consistent. They weren't true in the end, um, but were, yeah, were just predicting that it, it was going to have a huge impact. So, uh, of course, there were conditions that made a consensus possible. And that, that, that's my emphasis on three dimensions. Uh, if consensus wasn't possible before, it had to do with, uh, with what I mentioned, that uh, these institutions were right. They had contrasting again. Um, but that, that has to do with other, problem, with other problems as well in the past. So maybe I can't really explain that, but there's a lot of literature on that divide uh, that had uh, international causes behind, behind them. Uh, yeah, that's what I can say now. Eva. I'll use my extension. Oh. Uh, so, because, thanks, Vicente, for the interesting talk. Uh, so, you said about conver convergence in terms of, for example, providing more universal social protection. I was wondering if there has been convergence in ideas with how to design the welfare state in terms of how to fund it, so how, um, in terms of taxation systems. And so recently, for example, countries committed to reshape the global mm -hmm. corporate tax system. So they committed to, for example, minimum global um, corporate tax, and these were kind of negotiations led by the OECD. So have there been kind of similar ideas also by the World Bank or other organizations? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um... Yeah, that's an interesting development. Um, I know that at least the OECD has been um, very interested in the last decade uh, in, in fiscal policy and especially using it as a redistributive instrument. Uh, so yeah, indeed they are behind this agreement, global agreement on corporate uh, taxation. Uh, I think there's a direct, there's a direct a relationship between because the the there are two factors that are are behind this initiative that have to do with the um, first of all with tax havens that there's a international agreement on, on uh, there's the sense that something needs to be done in terms of tax havens and on the other hand the the fact that big tech companies are not paying enough taxes. Uh, and they don't enjoy the same reputation they used to have 10 years ago. So in that sense, I think it's, it could be related to this agenda in the sense that you have uh, views, at least in the OECD, uh, I don't know the World Bank. The World Bank, I think they are not, um, yeah, in, in that book, Protecting Gold, from two years ago, they have a, a chapter on, on taxes, but uh, I, don't, I don't think they have been that vocal. Uh, in contrast to the to the OECD, but they do recognize that big tech uh, companies that uh, natural monopolies in that were made possible by the internet uh, are a huge problem in terms of distribution of resources and democracy in general. So the OECD is much more uh, invested in in uh, safeguarding democracy than the World Bank, for example. So that's why maybe they. They have been much more emphatic. Mm -hmm. I've sort of follow up question to that one. I, I want. I, it seems to me that maybe you're overplaying how far there is a consensus. In, in terms, so you acknowledge it, like the instruments. Mm -hmm. So they they're agreeing they're agreeing on the problem, um, but the approaches remain to to solving it remain quite different. So for, mm -hmm. in so for social protection, say I think there's really still quite very different approaches taken by the ILO. And the World Bank. So the World Bank still very much a kind of residual approach, providing a basic safety net. Although 
some in some parts of the World Bank are beginning to suggest that should be universal, not just means specific. But it's still very much kind of bare bones, whereas the ILO is still strongly in favour of much more state intervention, social insurance type approaches. Mm. Um, so if 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 actually what they're proposing is very different, is is there really a consensus beyond just, oh look, here's a this is the this is the great challenge of our age. Mm -hmm. um... I don't think they're that different. I mean, it depends on, yeah, in terms of labor market institutions, I think they, they are very different. Um, and you see in World, World Bank reports that they many times criticize the ILO in a kind of very way. They never say that. <laughs> We're talking about them, but they are. Um, yeah, they, they, they might be different in, to some respects, but. Um, I would say that the main point, uh, or yeah, let's put it this way. Uh, these institutions are very different, mainly because of the people that work there. So they still think themselves as the opposite. Uh, so if you talk with people from the ILO, they still see the World Bank as the, the extension of America and Germany that you know, spread neoliberalism that is only based on econo in economics, etc. The same with the World Bank. They see the ILO as a completely outdated uh, institution and so on. So if you see, there are many reports that have uh, kind of bad dependence with that, those differences that you mentioned. Uh, but in, in flagship reports and in those specifically uh, about the digital economy and so on, uh, you find similar recommendations in terms of principles, at least. Um, so that's what I can say, really. Okay. I'm surprised. It's not my reading of it, but it, but I might not be reading the flagship. Uh, could be. Could be. Um, yeah, because as I say, there, there, are, um, there are reports that tend to be supportive of previous uh, approaches, let's say, or um, yeah, it's not. It's, I, I have, I've never said that they're the same. I don't. I don't think so. it's just that um, you would see different conceptions of development, like deeper grounds uh, in past decades, and you don't see those differences that clearly anymore. So, human development versus you know neoliberalism, that kind of Contradiction, you don't, you don't, it's difficult to find. You can find it, of course, in documents. There are documents that, as I say, this, these people kind of reproduce the same um, distinctions, but yeah, I have the impression that it's hard to find now. Yeah, I think I would definitely agree with that in terms of the sort of principles and the way that things are presented. But, I, but mm -hmm. then if actually, but you're below that, the yeah. recommendations are very different. And it, yeah. it's questions whether it's, yeah, it's just about presentation rather than. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true because you have the level of the, the institutional discourse and the communicative part. So what they yeah, what they put in declarations and so on are mostly principles. But in terms of instruments and the, the policy work they do in countries, for example, they are still very different. I mean, I, I'm not saying that, for example, Conditionality programs in the world that are based on this. That's their discourse. That's the the ideas they're selling. Right. I'm not saying that they that they've changed completely. I mean, that would be another pro probably another research, uh, another project. How they have effectively changed in their policy work, uh, more yeah, local. Mm -hmm. Um, did I see your hands? You did. I have so many questions, so I'm just trying to think what to ask. Thank you. Uh, very rich presentation. I think um, one thing which sort of I've been thinking as you presented and now answering the question is the following question. Um, okay, let's agree that there is a consensus within among these organizations to highlight the importance of technological change in different ways. Uh, they see it given their competencies and interest areas. Mm -hmm. um, 
But in that sort of convergence, is there an emergent understanding of social policy in a different way than it has been considered in the previous period, in the sense that you may call, is this Washington consensus plus, 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 hmm. keeping certain fundamental structural variables of social policy delivery or thinking about <clears throat> it intact, or there's a totally new thinking on the basis of technological change on how state society relations should reformulate their relations and look at social policy. For instance, what happened in certain countries, X amount of labor is not required in, in the marketplace. So what do we do? How do we pay these people? Support their livelihoods. I mean, is there a kind of total change of the view? So that's one thing. And the other thing is that. Um, what um, Johann started uh, the, with Schumpeter. Um, I think um, the issue is also was in my head, is this Schumpeterian state you described uh, similar to past discussions of developmental state? You see, I mean, that sort of nearly mirrors the idea that there is a, you know, state needs to intervene to have to make sure that society develops in certain ways in a context of uncertainty as well as change, major change in society. Mm -hmm. So that's something I've been thinking. And the other one is, I was thinking more theoretically, and I suppose teleology of development and change in society from the Marxist perspective just follows in sort of progressive development to a certain state of achieving social communism, whatever, mm -hmm. sort of teleology. Um, and Schumpeter seems to be less interested in that. It's more disruptive. And then whatever comes out of that disruption is not only about the economy, but also the, the political resolution of that relationship. So the way now Schumpeterians seems to think as you described them, is trying to contain that disruption in the political order. In these institutional arrangements, I, I, I don't see any of these organizations recognizing the disruption created by technology to let it go and then come up with a new organizational setup who cares about Washington Consensus World Bank. But they're trying to contain that change and its impact to maintain the system. So in that sense, I wonder whether the described Schumpeterian state is actually an anti schumpeterian state or not? Ah, just yeah. a few, a few, <laughs> few small <laughs> questions. <laughs> nice. Um, thank you. Thanks, Hakan. <clears throat> so the first question is: there a difference in understanding in social policy? It's totally different. Um, depends on the organization. So. The OS, I think the OECD looks very different. Uh, if you read the, the um, um, job strategy of 1994, job strategy 2006, um, 2018, I think there's a big, big change. Uh, because the, there's, the, no, there are no reports that support a complete liberalization of the, or the American model, in a way. That was the role model in the World Bank, in the in the OECD. I think there's a big change in their approach. Um, I think so. Yeah, if if I talk about universal social protection, flex security, everything seems like familiar, and it is. The thing is, this hasn't been universal yet, but flex security hasn't been proposed in my view as a kind of global model. It's being understood as part of the a very specific context in Nordic political economies. So I think it's interesting that the World Bank or the OECD, even the ILO have thought that or have come with the idea that this model can be implemented everywhere. Uh, in, in, in contexts that are very, very different. So I think that's that's new. Not the model itself, not the ideas themselves, but the fact that 
uh, it's being globalized or, or that it appears to be a global model. Uh, because in past decades, <laughs> we've seen that there's been, so there wasn't only a divide between um, economic and social institutions, there was a clear divide between global north and global south institutions. So the OECD was the country, the club of which country and so on. The World Bank, the opposite. Um, but now they have, at least in this agenda, the recommendations are universal. They apply to everyone. They don't really uh, specify if, if uh, the context in which they should be applied. So that's, I think that's new also. I mean, it, it talks about the globalization of global social policy, which is, uh, is interesting. Um, and again, it might not be that disruptive in terms of ideas, but uh, I think the way it, it has developed, this consensus uh, could be something more innovative than it seems. The second one is, uh, is the Schumpeterian state similar to past discussion on developmental states. I, I think that's interesting, that's a good point. Maybe um, it could be, but, um, but I, would, I would prefer to use the developmental state uh, in a very specific context, especially in the case of East Asian countries, uh, in which, of course, the state had an active role, but at the same time, in terms of investing in education, health, but a very limited uh, room for, very limited room for social benefits and for social protection, you know, uh, relying much more on in, in families. So, I, I would say that is a specific model that I'm not, I'm not sure uh, is the, at the center of these debates. Uh, now, we can use, of course, the notion of developmental states more broadly. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's the Schumpeterian investment state developmental. Yeah, probably. But, but it's, it's global. It's, glo it's not only for uh, poor countries that need to develop. Uh, the UK is following this kind of descriptions. You know? So it's not only for developing countries. Uh, so uh, about the third question, containing disruption. Um, I don't think it's about containing disruption. It's just about legitimizing also new technology. So uh, if you, for example, surveillance at work in the world, uh, it's not, it's not legitimate, it's not well seen, it's not something nice to discuss about. Uh, and to that extent, the, the only way this, some techniques can be implemented is through regulations, through social dialogue. That's what institutions are saying. They are not opposing to it. They are not, they, and they could, they could say it's not, it's not valid. It's, it shouldn't be that uh, companies or institutions in general are using monitoring uh, or, I don't know, uh, facial recognition, that, that shouldn't be the case. They're not saying that. They're, they're not really opposing to it. It's just, uh, it should be used as long as people are happy with it, and it helps productivity and uh, unions and so on. There's some social dialogue, some uh, normative basis that can make it happen. So it's not about containing, it's more about thinking about the, um, the intimation function that uh, institutions can have as well. I mean, don't you think? I mean, that function, the intimation function, which is right, is also legitimating the comparative advantage of certain countries in the system and, and creating mechanisms through which essentially those uh, countries without technology already being slightly disadvantaged in the whole process. I mean, because none of this matters to countries if the, te the technology transfer is not cheap properly so that they can participate in this debate because otherwise this is self-containing process yeah self-containing process of those people who are producing the technology yeah yeah for sure i mean there's a yeah there's a dimension of uh, probably international political economy that uh, that must be explored and that has been explored as well that relates to the interests behind this kind of innovation so some countries concentrate data, some countries uh, or some companies benefit from, employers benefit from this a lot. Uh, so of course you can ask 
uh, how do workers, especially in the, in the global south, benefit from this kind of innovations? Um, it's it's hard to find any. any <laughs> honestly, it's fine. It's difficult to find any any benefits, but the way it's being presented is as if it is beneficial for everyone, for all countries, for all the population. So it's does it hide uh, power dynamics? Of course, I, mean, I I do agree with that sense. Just one final question, Vicente, before we wrap up. So you were very yeah. clear that you're not interested in this paper in, in what should happen, yeah. but just in, what's, mm -hmm. uh, in what is happening, or in how international organisations, global organisations are responding to um, uh, digitalisation. Yeah. But can I push you on what you think, think this, about this convergence? Is it a good thing? Is it problematic? Or you see yourself... Is an entirely neutral chronicler. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, there are things that I like and things that I don't like. I think, uh, well, I'm, I consider myself in the like social side. <laughs> um, so there are things that are good that uh, I think there are arguments that uh, have lost strength in the public discourse, especially related to structural adjustment or to liberalizing labor markets uh, without any sort of um, mitigation. Um, I think that view has tended to disappear and I think that's fine. But at the same time, you have uh, organizations as the ILO um, that have adopted this for business uh, perspective. Uh, and I do wonder where are workers, where where's the global south in this kind of discussion and I, it's difficult to, to find any sort of interest for, for those um, dimensions or people that are unfortunately the majority. So uh, I'm, I think I'm more a, of a populist in, this, in that sense. Um, but we'll see. I mean, I know that the, the pandemic has had a huge impact as well uh, in, this, in these institutions, although most of them have followed the same frameworks. And that's interesting. Uh, they haven't come up with new ideas, but they used all the things they had, a human center approach, all these things to approach the, the pandemic. But yeah, we we'll see what, uh, if it's helped uh, or not uh, in the context of the pandemic. I think that, uh, I, I don't really know, but I would uh, assess this agenda based on its real implications in the, in the current context. That's what I'm interested about now. Great, thank you. It was a really interesting paper, mm -hmm. great discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for coming.